So we are recording. Okay. So we're, we're talking about the six three notes and uh, there are some properties that were in the video that you guys have for homework. Um, obviously, if um, A is less than B, we are integrating with B as a lower limit, A is the upper limit, then it's gonna be the negative when you reverse the um, limits of integration, just so you know. So gonna be, it's gonna be this negative counterpart. If the limits are the same, the upper and lower limits are the same value, then you don't have any error. You haven't swept anything. So the answer is zero. So think of it in a geometric way. If you have a constant multiple, like here you have f of x and then you multiply f of x by two, that's a um, vertical stretch. So now you've doubled the area. So that's what you multiply by k. If you have a three there, you triple the area. Four, you quadruple the area and so forth. Half, you half the area. Negative, you flip it over because it's negative. Um, because you know, remember you have a negative constant, that's a, a reflection about the x-axis. If you're adding two functions and integrating it, then integrate each one separately and add them up. Or subtract them, integrate them separately, subtract them. Additivity is a big one. Um, if you have uh, from A to B, you're integrating that, and also integrate from B to C. So basically, the upper limit of the first integral connects to the lower limit of the second integral. Because of that connection, you can just add up all those areas from A to C. Uh, max spin is kind of a weird one. Um, if you have the highest y value here and the lowest y value, if you find the height of the rectangle uh, that is defined by these dimensions, so b minus a is our width and the height is the maximum y value, then fine, you have this big rectangle. Or if you look at the lowest y value and draw another rectangle, great, you have that little rectangle. The area, the true area of the curve of f of x, which is contained between these two vertical lines, whatever area that is, is going to be in between those two rectangles. That's what it's saying. Dominance, if one curve is higher than the other, then of course the integral of the higher curve is going to be more than the integral of the second, second curve. So a lot of it's intuition. Uh, <clears throat> and this is a good example, uh, and we're going to do a worksheet on this later today, where, hey, I give you this integral, I give you this integral. And maybe I'll give you another integral. And then I'm going to ask you to manipulate it to get some other answers, if possible. It wasn't possible for D and E. We didn't have enough information. Uh, just because it, uh, the limits were doubled for D, whoop de doo I don't know what's going on past negative two or past three. I got no idea. Um, or for three, seven, I don't have anything for three, seven for G of X. I can't do anything with that one. Um, but you know, A, we reverse, B, using additivity, and it's reversed. Uh, for C, um, you know for negative two, three of f of x, we multiply it by two, and for G, multiply by five. And again, we're subtracting these. Um, for F, you're given another integral, and then you have to divide from one to three. We have from negative two to three, and you have from negative two to one, so instead of additivity, you can, I mean, you're using additivity, but you basically are subtracting integrals. So if you know from negative two to three is this, then from negative two to one and one to three, those added up, add up to that. An example two, um, if you were to graph this, plug in zero, that's two, plug in three, that's root seven, Um, if you drew this rectangle, that's area six, which is less than the area between the curve and the x-axis. If you do this rectangle, that area is going to be three root seven, which is greater than the area between the curve and the x-axis. And the, the area between the curve and the x-axis is what I'm shading in yellow, which I probably should have done right from the beginning. So there we go. So that's simple enough. So that's how you would show it. Um, you would just calculate the area of the first rectangle between, you know, with the height of two and calculate the area of the other one, or just write it out. Okay, now let's hit up um, the third page of these notes here. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, average value. 
Um, so average value is something that's asked quite a bit. Uh, it's something that people tend to confuse with average rate of change. So remember we talked about average rate of change, which was this, right? Or average rate of change is this. Because that's what it is. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a change, you know, you know, like say for example, here's A, here's B. You got some weird curve like this. You wanna know how does, you know, like maybe you're talking about like traveling from here to Los Angeles, right? Like you start at a certain location, you end at a certain location. How long did you travel during that time, you know? Um, that slope of that secant line, okay. You know, that slope is right there. But let's say I ask you something different. It sounds the same, but it's really different. Say I ask you, find me the average value of a function in that interval. So what's meant by average value? Well, just to kind of give you a quick, um, demonstration. Let's say we have the interval from one to 10. And let's say I knew the Y value here is one, the Y value here is three, the Y value here is two, and the Y value here is four. So what would be the average value of those four dots? What you would do is you add up all the Y values. So, you know, that's one comma one, that's two comma three, that's five comma two, and that's four comma 10. So if I wanted the average value, what you're doing is you're averaging the Y coordinates. So what would I do here for these four dots? I would do, you know, one plus three plus two plus four. And of course I have four dots. So the average value of those dots is gonna be um, 10 over four or 2.5. So that's what's meant by average value. In other words, it's the average Y value. That's what's going on there. And hold on one sec, let me just pull up um, my completed version of these notes so I don't miss anything. Come on a sec here. Okay, there's a question in the chat. Oh, 10 comma four, sorry. Yeah, that's what I meant, sorry about that. Thank you for correcting me. Yeah, thank you again for that correction. Um, but yeah, um, that's essentially what um, <clears throat> an average value is. Now, here's the problem though. The problem is that we don't have just, you know, if we're looking from one to 10, if you have a curve, so say you have a curve here, right? From one to 10. Do you have just four dots? No. In fact, actually we have infinitely many Y values that we have to add up and divide by, you know, an infinite number of, you know, intervals or whatever, an infinite number of dots. Because you have infinite X values in an interval as well. Uh, even though you're only going from one to 10, there's so many Y values to consider. So we'll start with a finite case. And I, again, I just showed you a finite case right now, but I'll do another one right now just so you understand what average value means. And we'll talk about how to actually do it when you're considering an infinite number of points. Um, so we start with a finite case. Now remember, um, delta x equals b minus a over n, right? Remember we have a curve. I know I've done this like a million times with you guys. This does some weird wavy stuff. You have an interval here. 
the intervals defined, um, if you have n intervals, sorry, n subintervals, <clears throat> you take the difference between b and a divided by n, that gives you the number of intervals you got. Sorry, subintervals. Uh, sorry, it gives you the width of each subinterval. So if delta x equals b minus a over n, you could multiply both sides by n. Actually, I'll do it over here. So delta x equals b minus a over n, multiply both sides by n. And then divide both sides by delta x. And then flip over both sides. So delta x, sorry, one over n <clears throat> can be expressed as delta x over b minus a. I'll explain why I'm doing this in just a little bit. But before I go any further, are there any questions about the algebra I just did? So again, delta x is b minus a over n. We've talked about that yesterday. Remember, you have the width of your interval. You have n subintervals. You want the width of each subinterval. So you take b minus a divided by n. That's delta x. If I do a little algebra, oh, the three dots means therefore. Um, yeah, I, I remember doing that like in maybe in eighth grade, ninth grade math. I don't know. That just means therefore. Yeah, don't worry about that. Good question though. Um, so anyway, if you do a little algebra, let me get a spotlight here. Multiply both sides by n, then divide both sides by delta x, and then flip over both sides. Then you get that. Now, <coughs> choose any x value in each subinterval. We'll call it c sub k. So therefore, f of c sub k will be the corresponding y value in that subinterval. So say, for example, I'm doing this subinterval here. I'll call that c sub k. So the y value there would be f of c sub k. So c sub k, comma f of c sub k. Okay. <clears throat> uh, question in the chat. Yes, n equals number of sub intervals. That's correct. Yes. We're going to assume that n is infinity though, because <laughs> you have, you know, we, we assume that when we do a definite integral. The limit as n approaches infinity. That was what we talked about yesterday, that theoretical abstract stuff. Anyway, so you have a bunch of y values here. So let me draw this curve again, because that's getting a little messy. So remember, we got a bunch. We got a bunch of y values there, right? You want to average them. <clears throat> so how would I do that? Well, I'm going to add up all my y values. So f of c sub one is one y value. You know, you know, I have like you know c one here, so I want that y value. I have c two, I want that y value, and these are all within each subinterval. So you you are also chopping this up to all these different intervals, plus dot, 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 until you get to the last subinterval, which we call f of c sub n, the nth interval, right? And you divide it by n, the number of intervals you got. So for example, if I have something more finite, so here's a, Here's B. So you have like say these intervals here. And we'll call this C1, C2, C3, C4, C5, C6. So I have six intervals, fine. You divide by a number of intervals. Here's the thing. And follow, you know, please follow with me with the algebra here. Here's the thing. When you divide by n, it's the same thing as saying one over n times all that junk in our numerator. Yeah. 
Same thing, right? You divide by n, it's like multiply by one over n. Like if I divide something by three, it's like multiply by one third. Same thing. Well, delta x, sorry, one over n, equal delta x over b minus a. I said that. So you could replace one over n with delta x over b minus a. Also, well, before I get too carried away, let me just repeat this stuff right from above. Now let's distribute the delta x inside. So I got one over b minus a, and I'm doing delta x times f of c1 plus delta x times f of c2 plus dot, 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 plus delta x times f of c sub k, or sorry, c sub n. Well, what's going on inside that parentheses? What does that, what does all this, all this jazz here represent? Think about what we did yesterday. Delta x times fc1 plus delta x times fc2 plus blah, 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 and so forth. The area, yes, the room and sum, very good, excellent. Yes, area, room and sum, whatever, that, work, that works for me. So we can express that more compactly using sigma notation. I'll need some space here. Change colors for a bit of contrast. So you can re rewrite this as one over b minus a times sigma. And it's up to you, you can use like k or any letter here, k equals one, you're going up to n. And the general formula is gonna be delta x times f of c sub k. Now, if n is approaching infinity, then what does all this become now? If n's approaching infinity, what does all that become? The definite integral. However, it's this part that I'm highlighting in green that is the definite integral. The one over b minus a kind of comes along for the ride. So it's one over b minus a times the integral from a to b because we are going from A to B, of course, of F of X DX. And that is average value. This right here that's tucked in the corner is how you find average value. It's not that hard. When you ask to find average value, just find the integral, but you gotta divide by B minus A or multiply by one over B minus A. So just one little extra thing you have to remember because they do that sometimes on the AP exam. In fact, we've even asked that on our final exam. Uh, we're not doing the final exam uh, for obvious reasons, but um, I remember we would ask that in one of the free response questions, like find the average value. And a lot of my students would find the average rate of change or um, they would forget to do one over B minus A part and they would do the integral instead. Um, you got to go, you got to go with the one over B minus A times integral. That's how you find average value. It's not that hard, but sometimes we forget what it means. And this is the derivation of that formula, that this whole process of, you got all these little y values, you add them all up, divide by n, because you have n y values, because you have n sub intervals, that's an average. If you do a little fancy algebra, remember delta x is b minus a over n, so we isolate one over n. We pulled it out from this fraction here, and we substituted delta x over b minus a, put the delta x back into the parentheses with all the f of c sub k values, we saw that was a Riemann sum. That's, and when n is approaching infinity, that is gonna be a definite integral. So that's kind of the thought process. 
And if you feel like you need to rewatch this, def please do. You know, this is all being recorded. Um, so going right down here. So what should we do now? If um, we have to average all of them, you know, again, I just did that for you guys. And this ends approaching infinity, and you get this. So we got that. And that right there is the average value. And remember, you're taking the limit as n approaches infinity. You know, we were doing this, the limit as n approaches infinity of one over b minus a times the sigma notation of k equals one n delta x times f of c sub k. Uh, also note that we assume that each interval was the same was of the same length. Obviously, a Riemann sum doesn't have that assumption, but we assume that for simplicity's sake, for this um, formula here it doesn't really matter. But just for simplicity's sake, for coming up with the formula, that's what we did. So that's the average y value. Um, it's the limit as n approaches infinity of that Riemann sum. And we know that to be a definite integral. But the one little extra thing is you got to do 1 over b minus a. So now we're going to do a practice problem that deals with that. Then we're going to talk about another theorem, mean value theorem, for definite integrals. And then we're going to talk about how to do antiderivatives. So we still got a lot to cover. Um, and given that we're not testing tomorrow, if I don't quite get to the last part of these notes, maybe I might save that for tomorrow then, and then we'll do some review. Um, because the more I think about it, I don't know if I want to really rush the antiderivative stuff, but I definitely want to talk about mean value theorem and um, do some practice here. So let's move forward. Example three. So use a calculator to find the average value. Um, okay, so this one, um, yeah, you're not gonna be able to integrate this by hand. So and again, uh, I still need to get my TI emulator going. Okay. Anyway, I got a calculator here. Actually, I stole this from school. Yeah, it says school property, but I'm here at home. <laughs> I'll return it. Um, so what we're going to do, uh, I'll just kind of type up the steps maybe if that helps. And then you guys can follow along and then tell me if you got the same thing. So what we're going to do is we're going to do um, alpha window option four. Then you're going to do integrate from zero to nine. Multiply one over okay. So here's what we're gonna do. You're gonna alpha then window in your calculator and option four, which is fn int. If you do that correctly, this should pop up. Something that looks like this. So there's four things I need to put in there. I need to put a zero, a nine, whatever f of x is, so it's three minus root x, and x at the end here. And then hit enter. So let's do that. Three minus root x. It's gonna take some, a little while to think. And then you're going to multiply that result. So if you did it correctly, you should have got 8.999999999 and so forth. Then multiply that by one ninth, because that's one over B minus A, right? So remember, we are doing that, one over B minus A times all that junk. So times one ninth, and you get 0.999999999 and so forth. 
or you could say it's roughly one. So that's average value. So that's part A. And again, I haven't taught you guys how to do the antiderivative of root x yet. Don't worry about it. You'll learn that next week. For now, you can use your calculator. So remember, you're doing the fn int feature. Now, um, if you have any problems with this, please let me know during the breakout session, because we are going to have a breakout session, and I'm going to go over it with you. So please let me know. Oh, the one ninth. One ninth is just that's part of the formula, right? Remember, average value is 1 over b minus a integral from a to b of f of x dx. Remember, that's the formula that we just had on the previous page. And what, what's my interval? 0, 9. So 1 over b minus a, b is 9, a is 0, so I multiply by 1 ninth. That's where it came from. Remember, I'm not asking for the just definite integral of f of x from 0, 9. I'm asking for the average value of f of x from 0, 9. So you have to do the definite integral times 1 over b minus a. That's the discussion we had on the last page. So that's what I'm doing there. But part B, so I just did part A. That's all I did so far. I just did part A. Part B, so part A is done. Will there be a value in that interval from 0 to 9 where f of x equals this average value? So if I were to graph this, so if I were to plug in 0, I get 3, of course. If I plug in 9, I think I get 0. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So if I were to you know, connect that, things look, looks like that. It's kind of curved. Actually, it should be more curved. Just need some steady hands here. There we go. <clears throat> so the average y value of this, of course, equals 1. So the question is, will there be a value of x in this interval where f of x equals average value? Well, yeah, of course. Of course, it's going to be x value equals average value. We just got to find where it is. So all you have to do is set your function. So the answer is yes, of course. What you do is set f of x equal to the average value and solve for x. Um, so f of x is 3 minus root x. I'm just using the space down here because I'm out of space. Equals my average value. And I just solve for x. 3 plus 1 equals root x. 4 equals root x x is straight up 16. Um, wait, hold on. I cannot do addition or subtraction. Sorry about that. Because I knew that I was out, outside my domain. That's what I meant to do. My bad. x is 4. There we go. x is 4. So when x is 4, our function equals average value. And that right there is the basis for the next thing we're going to talk about, the mean value theorem for definite integrals. The mean value theorem for definite integrals right here. As long as your function is continuous on a closed number from A to B, then there's some x value where f of c equals this. So what this means is that there will be a y coordinate equal to the average y value in our interval. That's what that means. There will be a y coordinate <clears throat> equal to our average y value in our interval. So this right here is going to be the y coordinate 
at x equals c. Remember, c is in between a and b. And this right here is our average y value, which we had that discussion a few minutes ago. That right there is the mean value theorem for definite integrals. And remember, we also had a mean value theorem for definite for derivatives, right? Remember, that was f prime of c equals f of b minus f of a over b minus a. We also had a mean value theorem for derivatives too. That was last week. So I'm actually kind of glad we're doing things kind of this way because now you're kind of seeing those two because usually you would do like the mean value theorem for derivatives like uh, if we had a traditional school year, we would do like in early December and then we would do this like, you know, sometime in February um, or late January and there'd be such a gap that you would, sometimes you would hard to, hard to see those connections or hard to see those you make those comparisons but since we did these a week apart maybe it's not it's not, it's not such a bad thing we're doing the schedule um uh no it doesn't have to be different great question someone asked does it have to be um differentiable well actually it will be um and the reason why is because we're doing anti so great question actually it's a fantastic question and it really serves as the basis for what we're going to do next week when we talk about the fundamental theorem of calculus. So Catherine had asked, does f of x have to be differentiable? Um, it's going to be. Um, and the reason why it's going to be is because you're doing the antiderivative of it. Um, we don't really mention it so much because um, we just don't. But I, I mean, if, if it were not differentiable, I guess we could still do it. Um, let me just think about this one here. Like if you have like a sharp corner, I suppose you still could, you wouldn't be able to um, do the antiderivative by hand necessarily. You'd have to use some other techniques, which we'll talk about in week four. But um, yeah, it's a great question. Um, but the, the things that if you are actually doing the antiderivative of it, like you know, the stuff I'll teach you guys um, next week when we start doing antiderivative techniques. Yeah, it's going to be differentiable because you're doing. But there are situations where you might have a really strange curve where you have a sharp corner where it's not differentiable in the entire interval. There are techniques you can use to um, find that integral still and still have this work. Um, so good question though. Um, we'll, so let's revisit that next week. So anyway, um, now this right here, we can rewrite this. F of C equals one B minus A times that integral. We can rewrite it as B minus A times F of C equals the integral from A to B of F of X dx. You know, I just multiply both sides by B minus A. And we will do a break very shortly, so I think we need one. Just want to kind of get through this part right here. Um, let me, my handwriting stinks here. Let's take care of this. Yeah, multiply both sides by B minus A, that's what I did. So again, this is um, three minus root X. And um, if I shade the part If I shade that, I know that area is nine. Because so that area is this. So that equals nine, I know that. Now, we knew the average value was four. Remember, we knew our average value. Sorry, our average value is one at x equals four, so I meant to say. That was from um, example three.
So if you think about it, I'm drawing this rectangle here, right? <clears throat> How wide is this rectangle? Nine. How high is it? One. What's the area of my rectangle? Nine. And was my area just B minus A <clears throat> times F of C? Where F of C equaled the average value because <laughs> we, we deliberately set F of C equal to the average value. So it's just another way of explaining why this works. Why the mean value theorem makes sense is that if you have the integral from um, 0 or 9 of 3 minus root x, which you know we calculated in the calculators, it was close enough to 9. And if you took the average value and multiplied by the width of the interval, so in words, here's what's happening. Let me put a text box so you, so you can really finally grab hold of this, right? Um, the definite integral will equal the area of the rectangle formed by the width of the interval and the average y value. And the width of the interval we call our base and the average y value we call All right, let me finish typing that. Okay, so definite integral, which is from 0 to 9, 3 minus root x, whatever value that is, that will equal the area of the rectangle formed by the width of the interval, which are our, you know, our base of that rectangle, and the height, or which is gonna be the average y value. So that just helps to really help explain the um, mean value theorem. And if I kind of give you another um, demonstration here, so see so you got this curve here, right? You got the area between the curve and the x-axis. So we'll call this A, call this B. So that's gonna be the integral from A to B of F of X DX. Now, if I took the average Y value, let's say the average Y value is right here. Let's change colors up. I took the average y value and drew, let's do different colors again, and drew a rectangle just like this. Where this is B minus A, of course. And we'll call the and then we'll call this like say C. So here's B minus A. That's X equals C. <clears throat> then of course, F of C times B minus A will be the area of that rectangle. And both these areas in yellow are the same. These are equal to each other. So that's essentially what's going on with the mean value theorem. Okay, this is a great place to take a break. So um, I don't wanna do pages um, five and six. I think what I'll probably do, and so now that I'm not giving you guys a test to take in class tomorrow, 
I think I'll probably make a video for the last two pages of these so you guys can watch that. So we could do some more time on um, review tomorrow, but I, I'll definitely do a video on this, um, the last page. Um, yeah, it's actually the last two pages um, later this afternoon and share it as, you know, the link with you as homework number six. But um, let's take a break, a 10 minute break. So we'll come back at 1030. When we come back, we'll do worksheet number six that uh, deals with more of this kind of stuff, especially the properties of integrals. So we'll do a breakout session for about 20 minutes or so. And then we'll talk about the end and then we'll end class. So I think that's how I want to do it. And then uh, I still need to talk about uh, <laughs> test number one. Maybe that's a good time to do that tomorrow to kind of, um, you know, since you'll be doing a test later that week and I'll, I could have that discussion about test one from the previous week tomorrow. Um, so anyway, let's do a 10 minute break right now. I'll stop the recording. <laughs> 